Okay, so I think we we're ready to uh, introduce uh, global uh, junior global Poissons. And Esther, would you like to would you like to kick it off? Oh well, uh, we had the last minute change of schedule. I thought you were going to announce that. No. Well, in case uh, someone still hadn't noticed, uh, haven't noticed, uh, we had a last minute change of schedule and the stand of uh, Charlotte, we're having uh, Leonid Rivkin as our first speaker. Thanks a lot, Leonid, for uh, um, for helping yes. us, for, for covering this spot. Uh, and the talk, his talk will be about multisymplectic co-moment geometry. So, uh, so before uh, before we begin, actually, so I, I want to say um, a little bit about the format. So the format uh, is uh, every speaker will get clean 25 minutes. Uh, all the participants will be muted. Uh, you won't be able to unmute yourself. Uh, and we encourage you to ask to relegate questions until the parallel session. Um, you can ask questions in chat and then, you know, we'll try to collect them and, and give them to the speaker. Um, and uh, for the speakers, uh, so you'll have 25 minutes clean. And then, uh, so after 20 minutes, after the start of your talk, uh, I'll unmute myself and, uh, you know, give you a five minute warning. Um, uh, and then and then when 25 minutes hit, well, we'll see, maybe you'll, you'll get kicked out. <laughs> we'll, we'll decide on exactly the procedure. <laughs> um, okay, so, uh, so I think, uh, I think there are no more questions. Uh, let me just. Uh, do the last very last minute check. Oops. Okay. Uh, okay. Okay. So, so now uh, I think so now uh, Leonid, you're 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 the only one who has the microphone unmuted. Um, so Nastya, would like to would you like to introduce uh, Leonid one one more time just before we go? Yeah, sure. So again, as I said, we're having Leonid Rivkin as our first speaker, and he will talk. Uh, sorry. Uh, He will talk about multisymplectic co-momentum geometry. Leonid? Um, okay, so uh, hi everyone. And uh, first of all, thanks a lot to uh, Nikita and Anastasia for organizing uh, this event. It, uh, I'm uh, full of uh, anticipation and uh, it's uh, really well, uh, well organized. And uh, I love the fact that there are social activities, but more about that later. Um, I'll uh, try to tell you a little bit today about multisymplectic co-momentum geometry. Uh, given uh, that uh, multisymplectic is uh, not completely common knowledge, I'll start by explaining multisymplectic. Then I'll give a brief reminder of co-momentum in the symplectic case. And then finally, I'll uh, combine those uh, terms. OK, so but before I start, um, this, um, uh, just a comment on the naming of this event um, that Matteo has just made in the coffee break. Um, so according uh, to Nikita, um, this event involves some kind of audience, but um, there is not more than one talk, but you have to pay for it. So we are on a workshop. Um, you can uh, read the remainder of the comic uh, later, uh, it is in the chat. Okay, uh, what I'll talk about today is um, joint work, first of all, from a few years ago with my thesis supervisor, uh, Tilman Wurzbacher, and um, two more recent articles with Antonio Mitti and Leili Mamadova, uh, who are uh, PhD students uh, and soon to be postdocs uh, at Leuven. Um, uh, I should note some of the central articles in, uh, in the field, which is um, this article by Martin Talis, Yael Frigé, uh, Chris Rogers, and Marco Zambon, where the notion of homotopy moment map or multisymplectic uh, co-moment uh, was introduced. Um, I, I should say that the paper uh, of Tillman and me 
uh, came out at the same time and had the same content as, uh, or essentially the same content as this paper, uh, as this paper, but they were we found that independently. And uh, the notion of weak moment maps um, is due to Jonathan Herrmann, based on earlier work of Matson and Swan. So let's get started with the mathematics. Um, the definition of a multisymplectic manifold is a manifold um, with a differential form which satisfies two properties. First of all, it's closed, so the Durham differential of the form is zero, and non-degenerate. A closeness is the same as in the symplectic case, uh, while non-degeneracy is a slightly weaker statement. So normally, in the symplectic case, we require the map between tangent bundle and cotangent bundle to be one-to-one, -one, but the tangent uh, bundle uh, and the let's say a multi-cotangent bundle have different dimensions in general, so we cannot require that. Uh, so non-degenerate in the multisymplectic case means that this map is injective. The form somehow sees all directions, but uh, yeah, not every multi, uh, uh, not every higher degree form can be associated by contraction. Uh, so the first example, of course, is symplectic. This is also the reason why we say that something is k-plectic if it is a k plus one form. We want k equal to one to be symplectic. And also in the k equals to one uh, case, we have a Lie algebra of observables. And in the k equal to two case, we have a Lie two algebra, which will uh, become more clear later. So k equals to one symplectic is the first example. And k equals to dimension of the manifold minus one is the last example. It's the case of a volume form. Those two are actually the only two cases where the stronger non-degeneracy, the bijectiveness of, uh, of this operator is possible. So all cases in between, we only have inje uh, injectivity. Uh, just to name one of these cases, uh, kind of k equals to two, the next case. If we take a semi-simple Lie group and it, uh, with its killing form, then we have a canonical three form on its Lie algebra. We can extend this free form uh, B invariantly and uh, get, uh, get a three form on the group. And as it is B invariant, it is automatically closed. And the semi-simplicity implies non-degeneracy. So, um, uh, semi-simple uh, Lie groups are two-plectic. They uh, carry a multi-symplectic uh, three form. I will uh, already do a little advertisement. There are many, many more examples. For instance, the same way that T star Q is a symplectic manifold, lambda K T star Q is a multi-symplectic manifold, uh, which is motivated by jet bundles for uh, classical field theories. Um, further examples include uh, G2 structures, um, strictly uh, nearly Kähler manifolds, um, and also uh, some unimodular uh, Poisson structures. I'll uh, say more about this in the parallel session. Now, uh, a quick reminder about symplectic moment maps. We look at a symplectic manifold and a Lie group acting, um, let's say, from the right, uh, preserving the symplectic form. Then we say that a moment map is a map from M, oh, from uh, from M, to the dual of the Lie algebra, such that if we compose by the contraction with any element of the Lie algebra. Uh, then we get uh, the function whose Hamiltonian vector field is uh, the infinitesimal generator of the action. So um, somehow uh, for infinitesimal generators of the action, uh, we get a choice of Hamiltonian function uh, from which they come. And we require this map not only to be linear, but also to be equivariant. That is, the action on M uh, turns to the co-adjoint action on the Lie algebra. I'll rewrite it uh, in, uh, in the dual form. So in the case when G is connected, the infinitesimal information suffices. 
then we can look at the map from the Lie algebra to the smooth functions that first of all lifts the infinitesimal action. So we have the infinitesimal action here. And we have the association of a function having a Hamiltonian vector field here. And we want this diagram uh, to commute. This uh, is the translation of the first property. And the second property, the equivariance, translates into uh, this map not being a linear map, but also a homomorphism of Lie algebras. And the Lie algebra structure here is probably your favorite Lie algebra structure. Uh, it's the Poisson bracket um, of functions, uh, sometimes called observables. Um, in lingo coming from uh, classical mechanics. And we want to, um, to construct something analogous for multisymplectic manifolds. Uh, why do we want to do that? Because uh, moment maps are very useful. They, um, uh, they have applications uh, to uh, conservation laws or conserved quantities. Uh, they are necessary for reduction schemes and ultimately also for pre-quantization or quantization, which uh, in the context of field theory are all uh, quite interesting goals. So what we need to, to generalize this to the multisymplectic case is we need to understand what observables should be for multisymplectic manifolds. What's the analog of the Lie algebra structure on the function? And uh, here is uh, the construction which we'll use for it. So, so we use the standard equation that, um, that usually is defined to associate a, a Hamiltonian vector field uh, to, um, to a function in symplectic geometry and we just translate it one to one to the multisymplectic case. But now if this is a K plus one form, this has to be a K minus one form. And uh, we notice quite, uh, quite fast that because of non-degeneracy just meaning injectiveness and not bijectiveness, this will not be uh, solvable. This equation cannot be solved for all forms, but this uh, is not a big problem. We just say that we look at the a subspace of forms where this equation has a solution. This is a, uh, this is a subspace of K minus one forms. And we can, similar to the symplectic case, just define a bracket on it. So for two forms, we just contract uh, their Hamiltonian vector fields into omega and get a new K minus one form. And indeed this form will be Hamiltonian again by construction. Unfortunately, uh, this, uh, this bracket we just defined is not a Lie algebra bracket. So the Jacobi identity is not satisfied. If we take brackets of free elements and uh, uh, permute cyclically, we don't get zero, but we get D of something. And now if you are familiar with homotopic algebraic structures, you already know where we are going. And also if you read the title of the slide, you know where we are going. Um, uh, uh, this forms a Lie algebra up to homotopy or something which is called Lie infinity algebra. We add higher degree uh, or lower, depending on your perspective degree to the Hamiltonian forms. We just extend it by, by the Durham complex in all lower degrees, right up until functions. And we say that this error to the Jacobi identity, it's not a bug, it's a feature. It gives us more information. So we define the thing which stands here as a bracket tra taking three elements. And this bracket will again satisfy an identity up to D of something. And now we, uh, we call this something a bracket that takes four elements and so on. And what we get in total is, uh, is the following formula. So 
the unary bracket or differential is just the Durand differential. Um, and all the higher brackets are basically defined by we are taking a bunch of uh, k minus one forms, we get their Hamiltonian vector fields, and we put them into omega with an appropriate sign that you shouldn't worry about. And uh, this construction is due to Chris Rogers, who found that this construction yields an L-infinity algebra. So we take the vector spaces Li, which are essentially a part of the Durham complex. We take the first bracket being the differential and the higher brackets that I have just defined, um, which just as a note are only non-trivial on the Hamiltonian forms. So on the lowest degree part, more about, uh, about that in the parallel talk. And this construction yields an L-infinity algebra. So something that satisfies this uh, slightly frightening formula, uh, which somehow is in the end just the generalized Jacobi identity or identities uh, where we have a bracket of some elements and the result of this is applied to, uh, uh, um, to a bracket of further elements. So we, we do have somehow the binary brackets, for, for example, with all cyclic permutations. Uh, those are, you could say all permutations are just the unshuffles as you like. It does not uh, matter for the instance, but you also could have, for example, D, so the unary bracket of the bracket of three elements. Or you could have uh, the bracket taking three elements applied to the unary bracket. Th this would be the terms of the um, standard Jacobi identity. And due to the quite simple structure of this concrete L infinity algebra, those terms will be zero and we'll have Jacobi up to D of something. So Chris Rogers found this L infinity algebra for multisymplectic manifolds and also um, an L infinity morphism into the vector field, which is surjective onto the Hamiltonian vector field. Now, this gives us the possibility to simply define uh, homotopy co-moments as done by, um, uh, by uh, Frigier, uh, Rogers, and Zambon in 2013 as an L infinity morphism to this L infinity algebra that lifts uh, the infinitesimal action. So this is the algebra we just defined, which is part of the Durham complex. And uh, we say that a co-moment is an L infinity morphism. And even if you don't know what, uh, uh, what an L infinity morphism is, you, can, you probably will believe me that it's a category. So there is a notion of morphism in there. In the parallel talk, I'll uh, say more details about it. Luckily, as the L infinity algebra is quite simple, we do have uh, explicit formulas which one can read. So an L infinity morphism from a Lie algebra to this L infinity M omega algebra um, is given by a bunch of maps, not only one map, starting with F1 going from G to L0 that as a reminder were the Hamiltonian K minus one forms. And we want this component to project correctly onto the vector field. This is the first property, which just says this is actually a lift. And the second property, which um, encodes the right notion of equivariance in this context, says that this is actually an L infinity morphism. It's not really well visible here, but what you have is the binary bracket to the Lie algebra, and then applying one of the components of the co-moment map. Then you have applying to the next higher component of the moment map and then using, using the differential of the L infinity algebra and a term which involves omega, which more, uh, more or less is the multi-bracket of, uh, of the L infinity algebra. Again, if you uh, are not familiar with L infinity algebras, uh, don't care about it too much because our first uh, theorems will basically say you don't have to worry about it. So uh, the first theorem says, uh, tells us when a co-moment exists. 
uh, using uh, the above description, we can derive obstruction classes, which lie in the tensor product of chevalier allenberg or Lie algebra cohomology and the Ram cohomology of the manifold. And, um, well, those classes are zero if and only if an L infinity morphism exists, if a homotopy cohomology exists. Uh, just a quick reminder, this is, uh, in the symplectic case, this reduces to the standard theorem stating that uh, these two classes obstruct the existence of a symplectic uh, equivariant co-moment map. Now, to uh, the uh, what we did with uh, Antonio Mitti was that we translated uh, this obstruction into geometry. So, if you don't like uh, double complexes, if you don't like L infinity algebras, you can just look at the whole thing in cohomology. In this talk, I'll uh, restrict to the case where the group is compact. We have a statement for non-compact groups too, but uh, the statement is somehow more neat to explain in a, a brief time uh, for compact groups. So we have an action which preserves uh, the multisymplectic form and a co-moment exists if and only if this one cohomology class in the cohomology of m times g is zero. If you like groupoids, you might want to look at this class as coming from, uh, from this, uh, this groupoid. And it's actually quite, uh, quite useful because from this perspective, it becomes very clear that if you have, oh, now the groupoid disappeared, sorry. Um, if you have an equivariant cohomology a class extending omega, then you also have a co-moment because you have an exact sequence, uh, not an exact sequence, sorry, a sequence from HGM to HM to HM times G. A particular case of it is the case of an invariant potential for the multisymplectic form. I put in the invariant just because uh, if we need invariance in the non-compact case. So I want the statement to be true non-compactly too. So in the case, uh, the multisymplectic form has an invariant potential, then you also have a common. Uh, those results have been already in the literature before, but uh, using this criterion, it's uh, there uh, quite simple to derive. And um, you also can derive other results, which were first found by um, Shabazi and Zambon in 2016 about existence of co-moments for product metaphors. Now, uh, the second theorem with Antonio uh, concerns spheres. We look at, uh, at an n-sphere with um, the standard volume form and uh, a compact group acting effectively on it. Uh, Leonid, yeah. that's a five-minute warning. Sorry. Okay, thank you. Um, so, and we say that this action admits a homotopy co-moment uh, co if and only if n is even or the action is not transitive, which when we found it was a little bit surprising because we thought that um, all spheres should, should behave similarly in this context. But as it turns out, even for the standard SO n plus one action on SN, if the sphere is even, we have a co-moment. So S2, the symplectic sphere has a co-moment, S4 has one, and so on. And S2n minus one does not. Uh, on the other hand, for non-transitive actions, for example, SON acting on SN, so we have, for example, fixed points, uh, we always have a co-moment. So uh, once uh, per talk, one should make a proof, even if it's very shortly. Basically, the cohomological obstruction reduces to only one group in this context, which is pulled back uh, from the volume form of the sphere by means of the orbit map. And in case of an intransitive action, we can, uh, we can factor this map through an orbit. And if this orbit, uh, there always will be, in an intransitive case, an orbit which is uh, of lower dimension, and uh, then this uh, here we, uh, the obstruction will be zero, so it will be zero here also. And in the transitive case, there is a classification of effective group actions, and we check case by case what happens to the cohomological obstruction. So, in the case of spheres, 
we don't always have a co-moment map, even though spheres uh, with SON uh, actions are a very, very symmetric object. Um, it would be nice to have some notion of moment even for, uh, for them. And this uh, notion has been introduced by Jonathan Herrmann. It's called weak co-moment map. And it basically is a co-moment map, but only restricted to uh, cycles in Lie algebra homology. And uh, otherwise, the identity satisfies are, are the same. I'll uh, talk more about that in the parallel talk. And this definition, which is only defined on a subspace, um, this notion that it's only defined on a subspace has the advantage that if uh, certain Dirac cohomology groups are zero, then it automatically exists. Uh, the only we only need exactness in one complex. Consequently, for spheres, they always do. So we have a notion of um, of moment map for all spheres, even the odd ones. And Finally, with uh, the work with Lely, which I'll go into more detail um, about in the parallel session, is that the only difference between a homotopy uh, co-moment and a weak co-moment is the last obstruction class. So the theorem is a weak co-moment exists only if, if and only if ci are 0 for i uh, from 1 to k, whereas in the co-moment case, we had 1 from k to k plus 1. There is only one additional obstruction class. Um, so thanks a lot for your attention. If I have half a minute, I'll just say that in the parallel talk, I'll make uh, comments on the details about the L-infinity algebras involved that I just skipped over just now, and maybe talk a little bit about conserved quantities. OK, thank you. Thank you very much, Leonid. Uh, so we can applaud with stickers, and you can you can imagine the the sound of applause. Oh, look look how many! Very good. Thank you very I much. Can't see it while I share my screen, I may un unshare it, right? Yes, you can now unshare it. Um, so uh, so we have uh, uh, about four minutes before. I probably shouldn't begin Joel's talk um, uh, before before the half an hour mark, uh, because some people might want to join. Um, so, but uh, Joel, you, you uh, feel free to start sharing your uh, screen. So for that, I will make you a co-host. Perfect. Okay, yeah, so we can see your, your slides very well. Um, so yeah, so we, we should just wait uh, a couple of minutes uh, before we begin. Uh, in the meantime, uh, you can use this, I guess you can use this opportunity to send uh, Leonid questions in the chat. So there's, there's also a couple of questions uh, on YouTube. Uh, so I'm just collecting them into, into a small file, which I'll, which I'll send to Leonid. And uh, I'll do the same with all the speakers. Would the slides be available after sessions? Yes, I intend to. Um, I, I intend to ask all the speakers uh, if they can, if they would like to, to share the slides with me, and then I'll post them on the website. Also, the do I share the slides with you? I just email? Oh, sorry. Uh, how how do we share the slides? I have a. Email yeah, you would just. Email you, you would just. Yeah, you would just email them to us. Uh, yeah. Um, also, if you if you like, you can. Um, uh, I suppose you can share them in the chat now. If someone wants to download them, if if that's not too difficult for you, otherwise uh, otherwise just email. Oh, perfect. Okay. In case anybody but, but wants will, to follow yeah. along and look at the slides, I mean, you you don't have. This is uh, <laughs> if if like if I'm like talking and do you want to go look back at an earlier slide to see a definition and you're getting confused, I think this is useful. That yeah. way you don't have to interrupt the speaker to go look at it. 
I agree. Page. Yeah. But we will still upload the slides on the web page because mm -hmm. whatever is sent in the chat yeah, you can... is not very solid. Uh, so Anna, Anna is asking a uh, organizational question where a schedule updates published. So the schedule on the website is up to date. Uh, and also everyone should have got a conference package. Uh, so uh, that also should have, you know, if, if it's the latest version, um, you should have the latest schedule. Um, and then Javier is asking uh, Slack maybe. Yeah, yeah, I think uh, also yeah. posting posting slides, handouts, or any other, you know, any other files helpful to Slack, I think is a really, really good idea. Yeah. And altogether, if you have, um, ah, thank you. Leonid also shared his slides just now to the chat. Um, altogether, I think, uh, uh, you know, to, if you have some questions about the talks, one obvious place to post the questions is in Slack um, because it's, uh, well, it's supposed to be the, the social uh, element of our, yeah. of our conference where everything happens. Mm -hmm. and also, unlike local chat, questions that are asked in Slack uh, remain in Slack. That's right. That's correct. Yeah, that's actually a very important point. So uh, if you send a question to the Zoom chat, then it will basically disappear uh, later. But if it's in Slack, then it's there. Um, and, uh, and, you know, uh, many, many people can jump in and answer questions like yesterday, for example, or two days ago, some, someone asked the question in the, in the maths chat and, uh, Alan Weinstein jumped in and gave a beautiful answer. So, uh, this is one of the benefits of using Slack. Okay. I think, uh, I think it's time. Yeah. So, yeah. uh, Nastya would like so, to introduce the speaker. Sure. I'm, I'm happy to introduce, uh, Joel Villatora, who will talk about, uh, homotopy theory and algebraic geometry of sheets of Lee Renard uh, structures. Hi, thank you very much for the in invitation to speak here. I'd also really like to thank Nikita and Anastasia for organizing this uh, really, really amazing event and for how beautiful the website is. I'm, I'm just like super impressed by like the, the design aesthetics of this uh, conference, which are really superb. I mean, this is like world class, so. Uh, thanks for a lot for that. Okay, so what am I going to talk about? So when I, so because I'm not 100% sure everybody is super familiar with Lee Reinhardt structures, what I'm going to try to do is go pretty fast through a lot of definitions of things involving Lee Reinhardt structures, just so that I can get to the point I want to make. But uh, if you get confused at some point and you forget, I shared the slide so you can look at the definitions on your own time. Uh, when I say algebraic geometry in this talk, I do mean kind of baby algebraic geometry. I'm not going to be proving, you know, any grand conjectures or anything, but I'm going to say, uh, like, I'm going to sort of make the argument that algebraic geometry with Lee Reinhardt structures is like possible and potentially very interesting. And then also similarly for homotopy theory, I'll show how you can do some interesting baby homotopy theory type stuff. So let's get started. All right, so the outline is First, I'm gonna look at the big picture. The, the first half is one through four, but I'm gonna look at the big picture and then I'm gonna define a lot of things like objects and morphisms. And it turns out Lee Reinhardt structures have a lot of different kind of interesting notions of morphisms and interesting behaviors. Uh, and then I'm gonna talk about like what happens when you take the sheaf version of all of these things. And then I'm gonna explain what I've shown about these things so far. Like what, what are some things that I've proven? Okay, so very briefly, uh, I got my PhD at University of Illinois with uh, Rui Fernandez. And my general interest is things like Lie groupoids and algebraids and foliations and sort of category theory. And so this is kind of how I ended up here because uh, a lot of what I'm interested in is kind of combining differential geometry with sort of algebraic geometry reasoning and category theoretic kind of points of view. So this is kind of a natural direction for my research to start to slowly lean in. But uh, I feel like this is kind of uh, where I've ended up. So let's see a conceptual map here. Okay, we have first Lie algebraids. What are Lie algebraids right there? Like things that sit on top of manifolds that replace the tangent bundle. And then you have these Lie Reinhardt pairs. And how are they related? Well, if you take if you take the sections of a Lie algebraid, you get Lie Reinhardt pairs, right? And on the Lie algebraoid bucket, you have things like cohomology, singular foliations, you have homotopy groups, 
fundamental groupoids. And for some of those things, we have the corresponding stuff for Lee Reinhardt pairs. So we have cohomology for Lee Reinhardt pairs. We have the subalgebras of derivations are kind of the analog of singular foliations. And then, you know, there's 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 obviously more to these theories than what I've put in four bullet points, but you get the idea. Going the other way, you have something. So this is maybe less well known or less obvious. There's a spectrum operation. But the, the one problem is that um, the it's not exactly clear that if you take the spectrum of something, then you end up with a Lie algebra, right? So this is something that just happens naturally in algebraic geometry, right? The, the spectrum of a ring is not a, a manifold, it's something else. And it's and it, it, the spectrum of a of a module is not necessarily a vector bundle. It's going to be a, a sheaf. So in order to make sense of a little bit more of this, we have to put a big box around Lee Reinhardt structures and we're going or around Lie algebraids. We'll call Lee Reinhardt or Lee Reinhardt structures, which are the sheaf version of Lie algebraids. Okay. So just quickly, I'll have, I have some slides of like interesting reading about these topics. So I don't think I have the time to really explain everything that's in these papers, but these are just some of the papers I've been looking at to try to understand these things. And also singular subalgebra, it's uh, Marco Zempelin. It's a very interesting paper. Okay, so objects and morphisms. What's a Lie algebra? A Lie algebra is a vector bundle, right? So probably everybody knows this. It's a vector bundle where the, you have a Lie bracket on the sections and you have a Lie algebra homomorphism from the sections to vector fields. And you have a, a sort of Leibniz type rule for, you know, it, it has a derivation property with respect to scalar or to multiplication by smooth functions. Now, this is pretty interesting. If you want to know what a Lie Reinhardt pair is, well, all you have to do is you have to take this definition of Lie algebra and you have to replace M with this with a ring, right? You think of that ring as like the smooth functions on M and you replace A with a module for that ring, right? So a Lie Reinhardt pair is, we'll call it A and R. And R here is a commutative unit algebra and A is an R module, right? And it has to have the following information. It has to have a Lie bracket on A and it has to have a module homomorphism from A to the derivations. And then these two things have to be compatible. Uh, one, one of the compatibility conditions is that rho has to be a Lie algebra homomorphism. And then the other compatibility condition is there's a Leibniz rule, right? That uh, it's the exact same formula for the uh, Lie algebra. Right? Now, what are some examples of Lie Reinhardt pairs? So I just told you that examples of Lie Reinhardt pairs come from sections of an algebra. Let, let me give you some examples that aren't that necessarily. So if you have any commutative unital algebra, then you can take the, the module of derivations and that's a Lee Reinhardt pair, right? Here's a more complicated example. Suppose you have a differential graded algebra for people who are interested in that kind of thing and assume that it's basically generated freely in degree one, which basically means that all of the element, all of the degrees above one are just wedge products of the degree one over the degree zero part, which because it's a differential graded algebra is actually a commutative algebra. So these are graded commutative algebras. And if you take basically the dualization of this object, so there should be a parentheses there, but it's fine. If you take the dualization of this object, uh, you can define derivations on that using this formula here. And you can define the bracket using this formula here so you can take a look at that formula in the slides if you want to examine it more closely. And you end up with a, with a, uh, a Lee Reinhardt pair. Now, uh, as a cute exercise for people probably who do algebraic geometry, this is a really easy exercise for people who aren't familiar. Maybe it's, it's kind of a little bit trickier, but you can prove that bullet point one is an example of bullet point two. So that bullet point one actually comes from such a differential graded algebra. Now, if you have a Lie algebra and you have an open set, of course, like I said, you can take the sections where you just look at what are all the, what are all the smooth functions over a given open set and what are all the sections over a given open set. Here's another example that's not necessarily a Lie algebra. If you have a sheaf of Lie subalgebras, uh, 
of a Lie algebra, right? You start with a Lie algebra, and then you take some sort of subsheaf of the sections that's closed under the action of uh, C infinity of M. So it's also a submodule. Then you get a Lie Reinhardt pair. And that is what is called by many people a singular subalgebra. And the probably the most famous examples of these are singular foliations, which uh, have some people studying them as well. Now, what are some useful constructions with Lee Reinhardt pairs? Okay. So, one useful construction is the notion of an action. Now, if you have a Lee Reinhardt pair, uh, an action corresponds to a homomorphism from some uh, from some like ring from your base ring to some other ring and a Lie algebra homomorphism that makes this diagram commute. What you should think of this is kind of like the analog of a Lie algebra action on a, on a, on a ring. Uh, and what happens is you can show that the, if you take the tensor product of S with A and then you take the pair that, that makes it an S module and then you combine it with S then you get an action Lie Reinhardt pair. Uh, I, I'm not explaining how to define the bracket on S tensor R, or sorry, S tensor A, but uh, that's an exercise if you like using this data. But uh, if you're familiar with the construction of an action Lie algebra, uh, I encourage you to try to, to try to check that this is actually also that an action Lie algebra is actually an example of this kind when you pass to sections. Uh, and if you have a Lee Reinhardt, so if you have a Lee Reinhardt pair and a homomorphism from some from your ring from your base ring to another one, actually, is that going the wrong way? No, it's 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 okay. If you have a Lee Reinhardt pair and you, oh, it's going the wrong way. Sorry, this should be phi from. Sorry, this should be phi from. From R to S. It's easy to get these things mixed up. Uh, if you have a, such a homomorphism, then you can do something that's kind of like a base change, where you take a fiber product over this tensor product, which you should think of as kind of like the, if, you, if you're like, from the point of view of vector bundles, this actually is basically like, if this is like the phi is like a smooth map, right? And this is like the pullback operation going from R to S. And this thing here, is basically the uh, the pullback bundle, right? So what you're doing is you're taking the fiber product of the pullback bundle with the derivations on your new manifold, and you get something here, right? And this fiber product exists because these are just purely algebraic objects that you can construct no problem. And this thing is canonically a Lee Reinhardt pair, which we'll call the base change. Now. Let's see. So now we know about Lee Reinhardt pairs. We know some interesting constructions. How do we define morphisms? Well, there's there is one really simple way of defining a morphism, right? So if you have two Lee Reinhardt pairs, you could just ask for a a homomorphism of the base rings and a homomorphism of the R, of the associated modules that's sort of compatible with the actions. That is makes some diagram including uh, involving the anchor maps commute. Now, uh, this, this thing here is kind of funny, right? But how do, you def how do you define this map? You know that this B comes with a map to derivations of S. And because you have this homomorphism, you can use a composition operation to go from derivations on S to derivations that start in R and then end in S, right? And then here you have a map from A to derivations of R. And this is really the only sensible diagram that you can draw that you would expect to commute with the anchor maps. So like you don't, if you really sit down and think about how do you come up with a diagram involving anchor maps that would make things work properly, this is really the only one you'll come up with. And then of course, what we want is that F is a Lie algebra homomorphism. So this is like, you should think of this as compatibility with the anchor and this is compatibility with the bracket. And so we'll call the category that you get from defining morphisms of Lee Reinhardt pairs, uh, LRP. Okay, so what are some examples? Suppose you have a Poisson map, right? So this is very relevant to this conference. If you have a Poisson map, uh, if you take as your ring homomorphism the pullback map for your smooth map, 
And as your algebra homomorphism, your uh, pullback of one forms along differentials, then what you will get here is a morphism of Lee Reinhardt pairs exactly in this way. Now, if you have, here's another example. If you have a Lee algebraoid, we can take sections to come up with Lee Reinhardt pairs associated to open sets. And if we look at the restriction of say from one larger open set to a smaller open set, this is also a morphism of Lee Reinhardt pairs. So the restriction maps. Uh, here's some weirdness. Uh, if you have a homomorphism, uh, we already know that there's canonically a Lee Reinhardt pair associated to both R and S. But in general, there's not a, a homomorphism of those Lee Reinhardt pairs. Um, now, I mean, if you think about this long enough, you might think, okay, that, you know, like it, it seems like it should happen, uh, you know, if you're like going at it totally naively. And then the more you think about it, the more you think uh, it's completely unreasonable to expect this to happen. But the point is basically that. Um, this derivation operation, right? The thing that sends R to dir R, R is not a functor. And so one interesting question that I don't really know the answer to is, is there a nice subcategory of commutative unital algebras for which this derivation actually is a functor? So for which there's like a canonical uh, map of their derivations like this. And I suspect that the answer is to this is something like et al. Uh, but I won't go into it too much. All right, so non-example, Lie algebraic homomorphisms. Lie algebraic homomorphisms are not morphisms of Lie Reinhardt pairs. So this is kind of weird, right? Because Lie algebraic homomorphisms are the things that you usually study when studying Lie algebraics. Uh, so that means that we have, uh, we have some work to do. Now, uh, what are some, uh, Sorry, one last thing. There's a theorem by Higgins and McKenzie. They proved back in 1993 uh, that every Lee Reinhardt morphism actually factors through an action Lee Reinhardt pair. So there's like a nice factorization theorem that you can prove about these kinds of morphisms. Uh, so, what about, so how do we fix this problem, right, that we have not captured Lee algebraoid homomorphisms in our definition of morphism? Well, you go to what's called the comorphism. What's a co why, why is it called a comorphism? We call it a comorphism because the map at the level of rings goes in the opposite direction as the map at the level of the algebras, right? So now the, the, the map of rings goes from S to R, right? R is always associated to A and S is always associated to B. And well, in order to define a homomorphism of modules, you need to take a tensor product of B with R in order to really make sense of this map. So that's what you do. And then you ask for a diagram to commute, right? And then you, I encourage you to figure out what are the maps in this diagram. They're all very natural. They're really the only ones you can come up with. But basically on this side, you can see that if you have a, uh, if you have an element of this, this is like a sum of elements of R with tensored with elements of B. Each one of these elements of B gives you a derivation on S. By composing it with a homomorphism, you get a bunch of elements of R and then you multiply them with elements of R to get an element of R. <laughs> I had said that very quickly, but I, uh, it's something like that. And then this is the annoying thing about comorphisms is they have a kind of ugly um, definition for compatibility with a Lie bracket. Uh, but if you're familiar with the definition for compatibility with Lie bracket for Lie algebraids, this formula probably looks really familiar to you. So uh, that, that tells you that we're on the right track. Um, of course, I don't have enough time to explain every part of this whole uh, formula, but it, it, is, it is fairly natural when you think about it for long enough. And so the category of Lee Reinhardt pairs with comorphisms we'll call LRP co. So what are some examples? So Lee algebraic homomorphisms. Uh, here's another weird thing. If you have a homomorphism of Lee Reinhardt pairs, you still don't get a functor to the category of Lee Reinhardt pairs with comorphisms. And this is even weirder because um, so this because if you assume that these rings come from manifolds, then you do get such a functor, or you do get such a functor. So uh, I'm really interested to know if somebody can come up with a nice category of rings that's a pretty algebraic and kind of classical sub 
like class of rings for which you have a nice functor into the category of Lee Reinhardt pairs with comorphisms. That would be very interesting to me. And if you have a Lee Reinhardt pair, you always get, if you have like a base change, then you always get a comorphism from the base change to the original thing again. Uh, and then this is a theorem. I don't know if this appears anywhere in the literature earlier. I encourage, I, if somebody knows, please let me know. Uh, so that's why I put a question mark on the V here because I, I'm not sure if somebody else has proved this, but it turns out that every Lee Reinhardt comorphism factors through a base change. And if you're familiar with Lie algebraids, you might think, ah, you know, sometimes if the base map for a Lie algebraid is nice enough, the Lie algebraid homomorphism factors through the pullback algebraid. And this is basically saying that, well, because we're in the algebraic category, the pullback algebraid is always fine, right? It's, it never doesn't exist. Uh, and so this factorization theorem is true. But in the category of Lie algebraids, this is false. So this is kind of a, a nice property that the algebraic universe has that the smooth universe does not. Um, so let's quickly get onto sheaves, right? So what's a pre Lee Reinhardt structure? It's a functor from the open sets to Lee Reinhardt pairs. What is a Lee Reinhardt structure? A Lee Reinhardt structure is one for which this functor is, uh, it satisfies the usual sheaf axioms, right? And then we use this notation, this little squiggly arrow, A squiggly arrow X. This is suggestive of the fact that A is sort of like a vector bundle over X. Right? You think of A as a, a sort of like a vector bundle over X, but because it's a sheaf, it's not really a vector bundle. So I don't want to use a regular arrow because this is not like a set. This is a sheaf. Okay. And then the, the ring of functions is OX and the, the module is A. Okay. So examples, take a Lie algebraid. Uh, if you have a Lie Reinhardt pair, you can define the spectrum of your Lie Reinhardt pair, basically. So as the base map, you just, or the base topological space, you take the spectrum. And then uh, lemma, there's a usual procedure for constructing uh, from a module, a, a sheaf of modules over the spectrum. And the lemma says that if you actually go through this process, you'll see that it results in a well-defined Lee Reinhardt structure. So it makes sense to talk about um, Lee Reinhardt structures on say a scheme, which are locally the spectrum so this is kind of like saying it makes sense to talk about like quasi coherent Lee Reinhardt structures or coherent Lee Reinhardt structures. Joel, uh, it's a five minute warning. Okay, thank you. Now, morphisms and comorphisms all make sense in the sheaf setting. Uh, I, this is where like the notation starts to get kind of, kind of annoying because already morphisms and comorphisms for Lee Reinhardt pairs are kind of complicated. You have to take tensor products and uh, write down some complicated looking formulas. So, um, but you can make sense of this, right? A morphism is basically a triple where you have a map at the level of topological spaces. You have a map at the level of the rings of functions or the sheaf of, uh, the sheaf of rings on the earth space. And you have a morphism of sheaves, right? Going from A to B that's compatible with the module structures. And we say it's a morphism if it's uh, locally a comorphism. So this is something that's kind of annoying. So when, when you go, when you define a morphism of Lee Reinhardt structures, so in the sheaf universe, a morphism corresponds to a comorphism in the algebraic and the like local geometry algebraic universe. This is an uh, unfortunate fact, but we call this a morphism because here you see that we go from A to B, and at the morph at the level of the spaces, we go from X to Y. So those two arrows go in the same direction. So that's why we say it's a morphism rather than a comorphism. Now. We can also define comorphisms in basically the exact same way. Uh, but we call it a comorphism because the map at the level of spaces goes the opposite direction. And then we say it's locally Lee Reinhardt morphism. What are the main results? Okay, I'm almost done. Now, Lee Reinhardt structures on manifolds, uh, if you assume that the ground field is the real numbers, which I haven't needed uh, so far, right? You can talk about Lee Reinhardt structures on manifolds. And when I talk about Lee Reinhardt structure on manifold, I always assume the sheaf of rings is something like the ring of smooth functions or the ring of analytic functions or the ring of holomorphic functions on a complex manifold. Okay. So we never, we never do any other kinds of sheaf of rings. So the ring part of the pairs is always uh, the sort of usual ring of functions. And you can define uh, homotopies by using this notion of morphism we've defined for Lee Reinhardt structures, right? 
So uh, morphism is like uh, uh, homotopy is like where you take something from A to uh, the interval zero one to B, and then you add some boundary conditions. And you can define fundamental groups by taking pointed homotopy classes of such morphisms. And you can define even a fundamental groupoid, right? By taking homotopy classes from the interval into your Lee Reinhardt structure. So here's one theorem. Each one of these homotopy groups is indeed a group. And this groupoid is indeed a, a groupoid, right? The, this is just a purely set theoretic claim for now, right? Um, so main results. There's a nice class of Lee Reinhardt structures which are called Frobenius integrable, okay? And the first main theorem basically says that if you have a Frobenius integral Lee Reinhardt structure, then you have a partition of the manifold into leaves. Now remember, this is not a like Lie algebraoid. This is really something abstract. It's like a sheaf of Lie algebras on your manifold. And I'm saying you start with a sheaf of Lie, algebra, Lie algebras on your manifold with like an anchor map and a bracket, and you actually get a partition into smooth manifolds, right? And then the other theorem, this is the theorem that sort of says that uh, homotopy theory should work for this setting. That if you have a vibration of Lee Reinhardt structures, which are, have this property of being Frobenius integrable, then uh, you actually get a long exact sequence in homotopy. So that, that's actually quite nice. And this is an extension of another result for Lie algebraids by Bryak and Zhu. So in the, in the last, in the, in the second part, what I'm going to talk about is more details on the definition of Frobenius integrable, which is really important for the theorems. Some examples of Frobenius integrable. I'll sketch a proof of one of the one of the theorems, and then I'll speculate wildly about properties of the fundamental groupoid of the Lie Reinhardt structure. All right. Uh, thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Joel. Let's let's thank Joel. Very very nice talk. Thank you very much. Um, so, um, as before, uh, I encourage everyone to ask, to go to Joel's, uh, parallel session to ask questions, uh, or you can, or, and, or you can send them through Slack or chat. Um, okay. So, um, our next speaker is, uh, Jan. So Jan, would you like to, uh, start sharing your screen. So I'm going to, I'm going to make you a co-host now. So again, we'll, uh, we'll wait a few minutes, um, until, uh, exactly on the hour, just, to, just in case someone wants to, uh, tune in exactly for your talk. Yeah. Yeah, sure. I am. I'm go share the screen. Yeah. And now we cannot see the camera. Uh, well, we see the camera. Oh, you see also. You also see me. So I. Yeah. Isn't, we also oh, see. Okay. Yes. We'll okay, good. good. So it's not, or, or maybe now it will stop. Yeah, now yes. it's stopped. Yeah. Now it's stopped. Ah, okay, so I don't know how to, so I can connect also with the computer, but then like, it will be just another participant, I guess, or maybe. That's okay. That's okay. That's, we, yeah, you can do that's that. That's completely fine. Yeah. If, if you want to look at, look also at me. Yeah, we, we do. <laughs> <laughs> maybe it's still better than the slides. <laughs> yes, that's right. <laughs> maybe. But very well, maybe. Okay, so you should also. Okay, so uh, yes, so I can have... see the two. So which uh, which microphone are you using? The microphone from your iPad or your yes laptop? Okay. 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 Good. Then yeah, make sure to keep laptop muted. Yeah. So the only problem is with your laptop. Uh, video it's very dark ah yeah that's a little better yeah it's not it's not that big of a deal but i can try to do something only if it's not too much trouble i mean 
No. I think it's fine. Yeah, this should be. Okay. So, um, while Stian is uh, setting it up, I just want to uh, make uh, a little remark um, that, uh, so even though uh, everyone's microphones are necessarily uh, muted for the plenary session, uh, we still encourage you to turn your cameras on uh, just because it, especially for the speaker, it makes a kind of uh, more lively event uh, when you have this uh, visual feedback. Um, so, uh, and, and, you know, if your uh, if your internet connection isn't so great that you're you're afraid that uh, having all these uh, videos on would drag your internet, you can always kind of just collapse most of the videos. And uh, if you if you have them collapsed, then they're not streamed to your machine, so it shouldn't drag on your on your connection. Um, right. Um, okay. So let's just wait a few more seconds. Um, I think it's time. Mm -hmm. So I'm happy to introduce Jan Pullman from uh, University of Geneva, who will talk about quantized modulus phases of flat connections and triangulations. Oh, thank you very much. And also, thank you very much for giving me this slot and also for organizing such a nice conference. And I will be talking about, oh, I will be talking about, about what will hopefully be my thesis. And it, this is done under the watchful eye of Pavel Shevera. So the title is Quantized Modulized Spaces of Flat Connections and Triangulations. So the first part is this old story, this quantized modulized spaces of flat connections and this triangulation that is, that is, this is the new addition. And the kind of modulized spaces we, I will, that, that, we, that, we, that we consider are modulized spaces of flat G connections for a Lie group G on surfaces. So this is the setup. And you probably know that such structures are abundant and they have many, many there are many important examples of them. What, partly because this, these modulized spaces of flat connections on surfaces, they are symplectic or Poisson or something I will use, a quasi Poisson manifolds or if they are manifolds, then they are Poisson manifolds. This is the famous atia bolt structure, Poisson, uh, symplectic structure, in this, and, and generalization of general, generalizations of that. And where is it? Okay, sorry. I wanted to see all of you. And there is a natural question to. What, what kind of, how to quantize these structures. And this was done by Pavel Chevra and David Liebland. And they have a procedure that gives you algebras that, that quantize these Poisson structures, but they are algebras in some kind of bit different category, which you craft using the Dreamfeld associator. And the question, and they, in this procedure, it, it involves cutting up the surface into into small parts and then gluing it back together. And there are lots of choices you can make by, while cutting up the surface. And this is the answer I want to, we, we will provide is how does the quantization depend on these choices? Okay. And I will try to, I will try to uh, give you all the necessary background to, to, to follow. So first, let me just talk about moduli spaces of flat connections. So for me, G is just a connected Lie group and surf and sigma will be a surface with a non-empty boundary. I will always consider non-empty boundaries. And then one can look at this space I will call M sigma of G, okay? And this is the space of all flat connections on the trivial bundle on G. So, so because the surface has non-trivial boundary, all the principal principal bundles are trivial, so at least I yeah. So so we look at just flat connections on on such on 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 this trivial bundle, 
and we take them up to gauge transformations. So gauge transformations, these are here, we can just see them as functions from the surface to the group. And if you have a connection, this is a Lie algebra valued one, one form on sigma, you, you can change it by this small formula here, okay? And there is an equivalent description of this space, which I think when people say character variety, they rather mean this one, but, but these two are the same, so. And so this other description is just, you look at homomorphisms, or group homomorphisms from the fundamental group of the surface to, to your group G. You choose a base point, and then you mod out by, by G. So let me maybe write, how does the G act? So if you have a homomorphism phi gamma, then, then if you act on this homomorphism by G, what you get is phi gamma and it's conjugated. So you sim the action is simultaneous conjugation by all the, uh, simultaneous conjugation of all the, all the maps. Ah, so Nikita has a, yeah. But I think here, this is the smooth category and so, okay. And the homo, this isomorphism between these two, between these two pictures is very easy. You just, for any flat connection A, you can take holonomy along, along uh, path. And because this, we only look up, we look, only look at gauge transformation, at flat connections up to gauge transformations, sorry. Then this holonomy is only defined up to conjugation at this, at this marked point, right? Because there is still, you can still use some gauge transformation. Okay, and what I will consider is a slight, slight update of this, which, con which contains the previous, previous situation. And what I do is I, I choose a few marked points on the, on the surface, on, on the boundary of the surface. So this is the set V. It's a finite set of so-called marked points. And so what does this mean? Like, yeah, one can just draw points, but for the flat connections, it means that we we restrict those, those gauge transformations to be equal to the identity at those marked points. So one, one thing you immediately see is that the holonomy is now well defined, is not defined up to conjugation because there are, there are no gauge transformations. If you look, if you take the holonomy along a path which ends at those marked points, okay? And this is written here in green at the bottom that this, another, this equivalent description is we look at homomorphisms from the fundamental groupoid with objects, those marked points to the group. Or well, that is to say this moduli space is just an assignment of a, a group element to each path between those marked points up, and the paths are taken up to homotopy because the connections are flat. And you can always just go back to the, to the previous picture because this space, it has a G action for each marked point. Yeah, this, is the, this, is the, this is the gauge, gauge action we, we forbid. So it, it remains as an as a action. And if you, just, if you just take the quotient, we recover the, the, the previous space. Yeah. And why, why, do we, why, why do people use this one, this space is because now it will, it's really a manifold. It's just, it's isomorphic to a product of, of the groups. And it's nice to work with. And at the end you can quotient and go back to the usual case. So let me give you an example. It's very simple minded. So we just look at the one punctured torus. So this is the torus. There is this one puncture, so there's a hole and to get an explicit description of, of the moduli space on, on this torus, one needs to do some, non, some choices. So there is a non-canonical non description. And the choices you, you have to do, you have to choose some path that generate the fundamental group, right? Because if the surface has a, has a boundary, this, 
fundamental group here or the fun is, is free. So you just need to specify the value of this morphism on generators. So here we, one can choose generators, generators like this, A and B. And in the case with the, where, where we consider the marked point, we just get that the moduli space is given just by a pair of two elements of the group, the holonomies along A and B. And there is an action which looks like this. So yeah, this is conjugation which corresponds to the to the gauge transform to the gauge action here. And if we if we don't if we don't want to see this as, as a surface with marked points, just as a surface with boundary, then the moduli space is G cross G modulo this action, right? The, the exactly this action. Okay. So let me talk a bit about the Poisson structures on this on these moduli spaces. This goes back to, as I said, Atia, Bolt, and then Goldman. So we fix a, one needs to fix a non-degenerate invariant symmetric pairing on G. Yeah, I should maybe write that G is the Lie algebra of our connected Lie group G. You should think of a killing form. Uh, and then there is a canonical Poisson structure on this moduli space. Yeah, which was given by Atia and both for surfaces without boundary and there is symplectic and then, but actually if you have a surface with boundary, you get just a Poisson structure. And there is a slight generalization one can do is, and it's not necessarily to, to have a, a non-degenerate invariant pairing because what, what one uses in, in the construction is actually the inverse of this pairing. So it's enough to take just the, just an element uh, of, of this space, so of the second symmetric power of G, but invariant. So, but, and if it, if this thing is, is non-degenerate, you can just invert it and get, get the pairing, but you can also take a non, non-invertible element here. Yeah, for example, zero, and then the Poisson structure is zero. It's a very stupid example. Uh, so what comes now is the gener generalization for this mark for these moduli spaces with with marked points. So re remember, if we have these marked points here, this is uh, this has an action of G of V copies of G, or let's look at this uh, also the the Lie algebra action. And then this space is canonically a, a something that's called quasi Poisson manifold. And there is this action that that that, it, uh, that that we have on this on this space. This is due to Anton Alexev and Yvette Kosman, Schwarzbach, and Eckhart Meyerenken. And let me just give you a definition what's a G quasi Poisson structure. So it's a G manifold M. So here, this is our moduli space. This is the group or multiple copies of the group. And there is an invariant bivector pi such that it's not a Poisson bivector, but the Scouten bracket with itself, which should be zero for usual Poisson structures. It's, some, it's this thing, phi m. We actually saw this thing in the first talk by Leonid Rifkin. This is called the Kartan trivector or carry an element. This is because this equation, this holds in the, for, would you define the invariant? Okay, I, yeah, maybe I will reach it. I don't know, so, so it's, a, it's a manifold with a G action, so you want the bivector to be invariant under this G action. Okay, sorry. So, and in this equation, we need to, I, I need to tell you what this, what this Tri vector is, and it's the and is is the G action of the tri vector phi, which is an which you have in the third wedge. So okay, so once again, if you have the Lie algebra with this non-degenerate pairing, you can define an uh, an element in third wedge of G. This is the th element we saw in the in the first talk. In coordinates, you can just lower the indices of the structure constant, and this is totally anti-symmetric. And then if you have a tri-vector here, you can act on it to get a tri-vector on the manifold. So 
one just gets such a one has this constraint and now if you look at the at the quotient space of this manifold by this group action one get the the by vector by vector descends onto the quotient but this right hand side here this is if, if you just look if you just act on invariant functions it acts by zero because yeah it's the functions are invariant so on the quotient you get really a Poisson structure and this is the this is the Atia bot Poisson structure so this way this quasi Poisson setting it it encompasses the usual Poisson setting okay and there's a natural question how to quantize these things so first what to to quantize these things right uh Maybe let me recall that if you have a, for Poisson manifolds, what, what one does, one has this C infinity of n and a Poisson bracket, and one looks at, a, at, an, as an, at an algebra A, which should be let's say, C infinity of m and power series in H bar, and a star product such that the zeroth order of the star product is the usual com commutative multiplication, and the first order of the star product is anti symmetrized gives you the Poisson bracket. And because the product is associative, one gets that the Poisson bracket will satisfy Jacobi identity. Okay. The situation we have here, we have this, let's say these functions on the moduli space. It's a it's a module under I will I will use the language that's a module under the universal enveloping algebra of, of V copies of G. Right. And it has a bracket but it's not a Poisson bracket because yeah it's a quasi Poisson bracket and what it means is that if you look at the at the Jacobiator this this expression you don't get zero but something yeah you get phi evaluated on these three on the three differentials so what the quantization should be so one can try to do the same thing it should be an it should be just power series with some with some star product but it does it cannot be associative in the usual sense because then the then the first order commutator would be Poisson. So this was first real, realized by Enriquez. And I think of the correct notion is an algebra in a slightly different category. And the category is this Trinfeld category. So you take it modules for this UG power uh, UG to the to V. Right. So these are just like as a category, these are just modules. For, for this universal enveloping algebra of G power V representations. But first there is this little H bar. This just says that morphisms are power series in the usual morphisms of, of modules. But what you do, you change the associativity constraint of your, of your category. And because this associativity constraint that, that comes into the equation for the associativity, and this, this this element which changes the associativity is called Dreamfeld it's called Dreamfeld associator. It exactly contains this phi. Then you get that the first order commutator of an associative multiplication in this category is a quasi Poisson bracket. Okay, so just to recapitulate, a natural notion of a quantization of these quasi Poisson algebras is a category, is, a, is an algebra in this category. It's an associative algebra in this category, which is a braided monoidal category. I will talk a little bit about it in the parallel session. Okay. Uh, so now, really, to quantize, I will, I will describe the so I will very briefly describe a uh, procedure by David Liblan and Pavel Shevera, but I should mention, mention that there, there were other works, maybe Alexei Grosse Shomerus and Rosse Senesh, which were quantizing the just the Poisson, Poisson structure on the flat connections. And also there is this approach by factorization homology by Brochier, Ben Svi Jordan. But let me go back to this, this procedure of, of David LeBlanc and my advisor. So you can use what you do, you you have this category of, of UG modules. Sorry, there should be this phi in H bar. 
and you use in some in some way this associated phi and the tensor product you have here to in the in in the following algorithm so first there is just one thing you one needs to do one is to decorate each marked point by either plus or minus this is not very important but it's, it's you you don't see it at the Poisson st level structure but at the quantum level you see it but it's it's possible to just pass from plus minus so let's i will not dwell too much in on, on, on this point and then what you need to do you need to glue your surface from these following basic blocks so the procedure basically says that for such block there is a very easy algebra that quantizes the Poisson structure actually the Poisson structure is No, sorry. No, it's, it's actually it's actually Poisson, and and just the just the smooth just the functions on the group quantize the 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 Poisson structure here, and sorry, to, you just have this building block, and then if you then what you need to do you need to glue the surface from these small building blocks. And you you have two post two allowed moves. Either you, if you have two points with the same sign, you can connect them like this. You can these can be either on the same side of the surface or on on the same component of the surface or two different components of the surface, right? So you can, for example, either you can glue disks to, to bigger disk, or you can, or you can. Or you can, or you can have one component and then then add basically genus to the surface. Anton is asking whether these building blocks are commutative. Yeah, that's what yeah, they are commutative in the painful category. And another another move you are allowed to do is to forget a point. This is this is this is easier and just this just corresponds to quotienting out by the action at at that point. Okay, but it looks like there are lots of choices you can do while while gluing the surface. So this is a question: How does this category A depend on this gluing? And sorry, and after after we make some modifications of this Leblanc Chevra procedure. Then one arrives at the following. So the theorem says that the choices you need to make are a graph gamma. It's an embedded, embedded graph. And it has two kinds of vertices. Okay, so it will have univalent vertices, which are mapped bijectively to the mark points, and then trivalent vertices, which are mapped to the interior of sigma. So there are two examples. Maybe I'll make them a bit bigger. Right, you, here you have. Uh, just a disk with four marked points, and this is this is one one possibility. I, you can also imagine the other possibility, right? Which would look like this. And for example, for a for a, for this one punctured torus, you you need to you need you you can do something like this. So the vertices in the interior they have to be trivalent, so you cannot just draw the usual skeleton as one would do. Okay, and because there is an important, sorry, important condition that sigma should deformation retract to to the to the to the graph gamma, right? And here you see that that, that it's the case in, in all these examples. Okay, and if you have this structure, then what we get is an algebra in this Dreamfeld category. This is a gamma in u g power v mod phi. So it's an, it will be an associative algebra in this category. So it has a star product, which it will quantize the Poisson structure. We, we want to quantize the quasi Poisson structure in quantum quantize. But not just this, we actually know very well how this structure depends on, this, on these graphs. And there's a following simple claim that any two such graphs are connected by sequence of the of of this following simple move, they are called flips or sometimes whitehead moves. And now, what I claim is that 
if you have, uh, if you have, if if two, if two of these graphs are related by such a such a move, then there is an explicit isomorphism between these two algebras. And not just that, but this isomorphism is actually compatible with the relations among flips. Because it can happen that if you do many flips, you end up in the same, same graph. And the claim is that the composition of all these isomorphisms is identity at the end. So one can say that, that, this, that this functor, which gives you the algebra, is a functor from the Ptolemy groupoid of sigma, which is just the groupoid where objects are just the or are this are these uh, mm, these graphs. Anton is asking what about the mapping class group action? Yes, then the mapping class group acts on on, on this algebra. On if you choose one one graph and then the map then you choose an element of the mapping class group, it, it changes it to a different graph and you can go back. This gives you an element of the mapping class group. Uh, which relates slightly to the following. Yeah, I am written, writing it here, and it's it's related slightly to to this to the follow, to a slightly more general claim that if you embed a, a surface to a bigger surface, that and then the embedding is compatible with the with the graph, then you get an algebra morphism in the same direction. Yeah, there are two two dual dualized duals, so you get a morphism in the same direction. There's, if I have 20 seconds, there's just one thing I want to say because in the abstract I talk about triangulations. And here I'm not talking about triangulations, but I'm actually talking about the, the dual thing, the graph. And that's because, for example, the triangulations can be somewhat, somewhat singular because, for example, this is a really nice graph, but seeing this as a triangulation of the disk with two marked points is it's, it's like this. It's not very nice. Okay, so I thank you for your attention and you can see what I plan to do in the parallel session. Okay, thank you very much, Jan. Let's thank Jan with emojis. As if, if anyone has uh, read my introduction on Slack, you know that I love emojis, so I particularly appreciate the clapping emojis. I hope Jan, you uh, like my <laughs> But anyway, so I'll... I'll uh, use my privilege of the microphone on. To thank this. you, thank so, you. Thank you very much for this very nice talk. So um, we have one more talk in the plenary session uh, by Philip. Um, so uh, so Philip, uh, where are you? I need to find you, there you are. <laughs> so I'm going to make you a co-host so you should be able to share your, uh, your slides now. And also, I'm going to ask you to unmute yourself. Yep. OK. And uh, so, yes, as always, uh, with Jan, uh, I'm sure there's many more questions. I mean, I, I also have questions, but I, I encourage everyone to postpone them until the uh, parallel session in just about half an hour. Um, and also, you can ask them in Slack. Um, uh, there was one. Oh, yes. So uh, whilst uh, Jan is getting his slides ready, uh, I wanted to mention, uh, again, just to kind of explain a little bit about the format. Uh, so we have one more plenary talk, uh, uh, this time by Philip. Um, and then we will all split uh, into four uh, Parallel sessions, one for each speaker, and you're you're welcome to uh, you know browse, circulate between the rooms. So the uh, roughly the first half an hour of a parallel session will be the second part of each speaker's talk, uh, which will be a lot more interactive. Uh, so uh, you you you're free to ask questions, interrupt, um, you know, turn it into a discussion. Um, and that, so, so that will be roughly, tw you know, a 25 minute, uh, uh, this kind of interactive second, second part of the talk. And that will be followed by about half an hour of discussion time. So you should stay in the room and, uh, um, speakers should stay in the room and, uh, participants, you can circulate around the rooms and ask questions, uh, for clarification, um, or whatnot. Um, and then, uh, 
so what happens then is uh, after about an hour of the parallel session, I encourage everyone to take a screen free break of 10 to 15 minutes. Just, just step away from your screen uh, because it by then it will have been about three hours that you're glued to your computer. You should definitely take, take a break. And then after that, we'll have uh, an hour and a bit of uh, a social time. So this is something we're kind of uh, implementing on an experimental basis. Hopefully this will work. Uh, surely there will be some, uh, you know, some things will probably go wrong, but I guess that's, that's part of the experience. Um, and uh, so uh, we have, th there's going to be three game rooms, which you uh, can join. Uh, you can basically join them at any time, but of course it is always best to join on time at the beginning um, of the, uh, of the social time block. Um, if you join late, then you'll still be able to participate, but you, you might have to wait, uh, you know, for a new game to start or, or whatever the activity is. It depends on the activity. So there's three activities. One of them is called Random Chats. There's a Pictionary and a, a board game called Codenames, which I particularly like. So uh, there are descriptions of them uh, in the conference package of how this works, particularly how this works in the online setting. So please have a look before uh, before you join, so you kind of uh, can make a, a, an educated choice. Um, okay, so uh, I think it's probably time. Uh, what do you think, Nastya? Should we start? Yeah, yeah, I think we should start. Okay. Uh, and I'm glad to announce our last talk of this first uh, Eastern Hemisphere session. And our speaker is Philip Schmidt from University of Copenhagen, who will talk about quantization of conjoint orbits. Okay, thank you for the introduction. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak here. And also thank you for organizing this wonderful workshop with all the social activity and so on and so forth, which is probably quite new for a lot of people. At least it will be new for me. Okay, I hope everyone can hear me well. And I hope everyone can see my slides. Good, perfect. And with that, let me just say that this is mainly the results of my PhD thesis, which I handed in two weeks ago at the University of Copenhagen. And it's mainly about quantization of cojoint orbits. So let's just get started and basically with a very short recap of the quantization problem. So the idea is we have a classical physical system. So that is usually described by, yeah, thanks Nikita. Uh, that is usually described by Poisson manifold M and this, the observables, so the quantities that we can measure are real valued smooth functions on this Poisson manifold. And now the time evolution is usually just given by the fact that the time derivative of such, such an observable is uh, given by the Poisson bracket with a so-called Hamiltonian function. And this Hamiltonian function essentially describes the energy of the system. Okay, on the other hand, we have quantum mechanics and in quantum mechanics, we usually consider some Hilbert space H and observables are then some self-adjoint elements and some algebra of typically unbounded operators on this Hilbert space. And even though this algebra a priori looks quite different, the time evolution is very much similar to the classical case. So again, the time derivative of an observable is given now by taking the commutator with a so-called Hamiltonian observable, again, describing sort of the energy of the system. So from a mathematical point of view, if you look at the mathematical structure, then on the classical side, we have the smooth functions on our manifold together with a Lie bracket. And this Lie bracket is just given by the Poisson bracket. Whereas on the quantum mechanical side, well, we have a non-commutative algebra and then the commutator rescaled by this I times H bar that serves as a Lie bracket. So sort of the observable algebras, their structure is rather similar. And well, you all know that classical physics is sort of a very good approximation in, on macroscopic scales. So in everyday life, so if you let H bar this parameter which sort of describes how quantum our system is. If that becomes small, then we would like to recover classical physics. And on the other hand, the quantization problem is essentially the problem of associating to a classical system, some quantum system in such a way that, well, um, essentially we recover the classical system again when we let H bar tend to zero. Okay, and well, when I say here, quantum mechanics are usually 
want to, to basically forget about the representation on the Hilbert space in the following, and I want to focus on the observable algebra up here. And essentially, I would like to have, or I would like to think of it as some, well, for, for every value of H bar, we basically have some algebra. So we really have a field of algebras. And then how does classical physics arise from that? Essentially, it arises if you just look at the limit where h bar tends to zero, and then only remember the first order approximation. So, so this console bracket sort of plays the role of a first order infinitesimal. And well, now we can also look at the infinite order infinitesimal, and that will just be the form, will be a formal deformation quantization, as you have already seen it in the last talk. And I will again define it on my next slide. So, in a sense, that is just you take your whole field of algebras and you look at the Taylor series expansion or the jet at h bar being zero. Okay, and in a sense, you can view these formal deformation quantizations as splitting the quantization problem into two parts, namely one algebraic part and then one analytic part that if where first you try to sort of upgrade your first order infinitesimals to infinite order, and then you somehow try to make sense of these power series by somehow seeing whether they're convergent or not. So that usually is an analytic problem. And now what I want to do in the basically rest of the talk, I want to explain to you how for the special case of cold joint orbits, how to actually construct such fields of quantum algebras in a Frechet algebraic world, which well, I will say something about in, in a minute. Okay, but for now, here's the brief reminder about the formal deformation quantization as we have already seen it in the last talk and as it was introduced by Bayern, Flato, von Stalich, Narowitz, and Sternheimer. And I will essentially use the formal star product and the formal deformation quantization interchangeably. So if we start with a Poisson manifold, such a formal star product is just given by a product on formal power series of smooth functions. It is assumed to be associative, which is very important, and well, bilinear over formal power series, such that well, when you expand it, so when you take two smooth functions, f and g, the result of that multiplication is in general a power series. So if you expand it as a power series, these operators CR, they should be bidifferential operators so that you can actually restrict your star product to open subsets because it becomes a local operation. And well, we want to have the correct limits as already in the last talk, the zeroth order should be the product and sort of the commutator and first order should reproduce the Poisson bracket. Okay, and then there's one more technical condition namely that the constant function is still a unit for this deformed product. And I should say here that I will always use new as a formal parameter. And I will always use h bar only for actual complex numbers. Okay, so whenever you see an h bar, you already know that that is really a complex number. And whenever you see a new, that is going to be a formal parameter. Okay, and well, then there's a then the theorem by Konsevich, or it's a consequence of his formality theorem that these formal star products actually exist on any Poisson manifold. Or in different words, whenever you have one of these first order infinitesimals, like a Poisson structure, you can actually quantize it to such an infinite order of formal deformation. Okay, and while Konsevich not only gives an existence result, he also sort of has a way, or it also, for, uh, from his theorem, it also follows that you can, um, classify these formal star products up to some notion of equivalence. But that will not be relevant in the following. Okay, so let me maybe continue by telling you that it is not completely trivial to actually come up with, a, with such a field of algebras that has a correct expansion. And let me illustrate that by one example, which ac actually works in an um, equivariant setting. So if you just have an action of a Lie group, on all the objects that we're working with here, and then ask all the products to be equivalent with respect to this action, then we can actually, then there is a theorem by Riefel, which essentially tells us that already for the two sphere, we cannot sort of quantize it in a nice C-star algebraic way if you also require equivariance. So here is the statement of the theorem. Basically, if we take the smooth functions on the two sphere, and well, whenever we, we now consider a new product that is non-commutative on the space, such that for this product, there is some involution, some star involution and, and some norm, such that the completion with respect to that norm becomes a C-star algebra. Okay, 
And if you also assume that the rotations, just as uh, the special orthogonal group, just acts on the two sphere as usual by rotations and then on the smooth functions by pullback, and that this action is isometric and a star automorphism, so nicely compatible with this product and this involution, then it turns out that this product is automatically commutative. And well, in a sense, what this means is whenever we try to construct, say, C star algebras over here that sort of contain the smooth functions on the two sphere, and whenever we try to do that equivariantly with respect to this action of SO3, then these algebras here will automatically be commutative. So sort of whenever we try to look at the Taylor expansion, well, all possible brackets that we can quantize in this way will automatically be trivial. Or in other words, well, an equivariant quantization of the two sphere in a C star algebraic setting and such that all these C star algebras sort of contain the smooth functions, that is simply not possible. Okay, and well, let me say that it's already enough to assume that it contains all the polynomials on the two sphere. So we can, yeah. So, so in a sense that tells us that this problem of passing say from, an, from a formal deformation quantization to some actual field of algebras, that is at least non-trivial. Of course, and one can argue that one should also sort of quantize the action of SO3 and so on and so forth. But I just want to use this to illustrate that this problem is actually or can be non-trivial. And well, what I want to do in the following is I essentially want to propose a way to sort of not use C star algebras, but to use so-called Fréché algebras and to obtain a field of Fréché algebras that sort of um, quantize cogent orbits just as presented on the first slide. Okay, and here is a essential approach that was proposed by Beiser and Waldmann and carried out in many examples by some collaborators of them. And the idea is essentially we take all the information of a formal deformation quantization into account. And it is sort of, as you've seen on the last slide, easy or relatively easy to find such formal deformation quantizations, or at least their existence is well understood. So we start with such a formal deformation quantization. And then we simply ask whether we can find some subalgebra of functions for which the formal power series are not infinite series, but just finite sums. So meaning, if you take two elements, P and Q, of such an algebra, we just want P star Q to be a finite sum. And well, if you have a finite sum, then we can just replace this formal parameter nu by an actual complex number, and we obtain a real family of products. So that, that means for every value of H bar, we just get a product on P on the subalgebra that we chose in the beginning. And of course, such an algebra might not exist in general, but at least in a lot of examples, for example, cogent orbits, it will exist and, it will, and there will be a canonical choice of such an algebra. Okay, and then finally, we can try to find some topology on this algebra with respect to which the product is continuous. So that first of all, the product extends to the completion. And while the idea is just now we have a topological algebra, which is nicer to work with, for example, when we want to study its representation, representations. And on the other hand, um, this algebra contains more interesting functions that we can possibly quantize because we have completed the algebra that we had before. Okay, and now in the rest of the talk, I would essentially like to explain to you how this works for cojoint orbits. But since this is a bit technical, I will restrict myself to one special case, which is essentially complex projective space. And remember that the two sphere that we've seen here is just complex projective space with complex dimension one. So that is included in an example. And this case is sort of the one that is relevant for many C-star algebraic quantization procedures. Or, or say this example is, is, is very hard, or it's a very hard, uh, many quantization procedures fail for the two sphere. Let's just put it like that. And what I want to present to you now is essentially something that works for the two sphere for complex projective spaces for arbitrary cojoint orbits in a Fréché algebraic setting. Okay, so, so here's, here's the idea. I will mainly try to explain to you now which algebra we can use for these polynomial functions and what the completion of that algebra is. And so the bottom left corner, that will be what plays the role of the polynomials. This A of CPN will be the completion. 
and this upper row is, is used to define these algebras and I will explain to you this diagram in the next one or two slides. Okay, so what is the idea? First of all, very brief reminder, complex projective space, now you have an action of C without zero on C1 plus N just by component wise multiplication. And then you essentially just take equivalence classes and that gives you complex projective space. And now to define polynomials on complex projective space, we start with a polynomial on C1 plus N. We assume that this polynomial is invariant under the group U1 acting on C1 plus N just by component wise multiplication. And then if you have such a polynomial, you can essentially restrict it to the sphere sitting inside C1 plus N. And then we can remember that CPN is just a quotient of the sphere by the action of U1. And well, since our polynomial was assumed to be U1 invariant, it will descend to, to CPN. So, and all the functions we obtain in this way, so all the functions that can be written as, that can be, that can be obtained in this way, that is what we call the polynomials on CPN. Okay, here is how you should think at least about these U1 invariant polynomials on C1 plus N. That is essentially just to take coordinates, Z1 as Z0 up to Zn, and then these polynomials will be polynomials in, in the Zi's and Zi bars, so they're complex conjugates, such that well, each monomial has exactly as many sets as it has Z bars. Okay, so, so that should tell you what this lower left corner is. And now I need to explain to you what this, what I mean by the CP hat N, which is sort of some larger space than complex projective space into, vi into which the complex projective space embeds. So here is the explicit definition. It is just a subset of CPN times itself. And it is the set of those pairs, which essentially are not having scalar products zero with each other. So we just take CPN times CPN, and then we essentially remove those points where all the, uh, that have scalar product zero. So in particular, the CPN hat will not be compact anymore. And in particular, there will be non-trivial holomorphic functions on there. And well, the regular CPN just embeds into this extended CPN if you just send an equivalence class of a point set to the equivalence class of set and its complex conjugate. And now it's easy to check, well, if you evaluate this condition well set times set bar that will always give you some, something non-zero because well set is non-zero if it defines an element of complex projective space. Okay so we have this embedding of CPN into some larger complex manifold and now we can essentially just look at the restriction of all these holomorphic functions on CPN on this extended CPN back to CPN. So we take a holomorphic function on this extended CPN, and it turn, then it turns out that it is already uniquely determined by its restriction to the regular one. So you might know this from um, complex analysis and several complex variables. If you have a holomorphic function, then it's already uniquely determined by its restriction to the anti-diagonal. Okay, so in particular, what this tells us is that this sort of Restriction map is injective. Or in other words, if we just define A of CPN as the image of this restriction map, then we again obtain an algebra, and it is actually going to be isomorphic to the holom holomorphic functions on this extended space. Okay, and now the last thing that I need to tell you is that, well, the polynomials on CPN, they are first of all really a subset of these analytic functions. And secondly, if you take the holomorphic functions on CPN, on this extended CPN, then there is a topology, which is just a topology of local uniform convergence. And the holomorphic functions are complete with respect to that topology. So we can just consider the corresponding topology on these analytic functions by using this isomorphism. And then the polynomials will be dense. Okay, what is the idea now? Let me maybe just go back. I already said the role of P will be, uh, uh, these polynomials on CPN, they will play the role of P. 
and well, these analytic functions, they will essentially be the completion. And here is now a theorem essentially about SU1 plus N equivariant quantization of complex projective space. And well, remember that in the case N equals one, we just have SU2 equivariant quantization of the two sphere and SU2 could also be replaced by SO3 in this context. So that solves sort of the problem from the beginning. And well, what this theorem says for basically every value of H bar, that is not an inverse of a natural number. There is some SU1 plus N equivariant product on this algebra that I just described to you. Okay, and um, okay, so, so there is this, I should say, I formulated this as an existence result. That is mainly because I don't have time to explain to you how this product is actually constructed in this first half of the talk. I will do that in the second half, but this is really not an existence result. This is really very explicit. So we really start by constructing a formal star product and then basically, basically using this approach that I outlined, outlined to you in the beginning, that it, that it is well defined on polynomials and extends to this algebra. Okay, finally, I should also tell you what a Fréché algebra is. Essentially, a Fréché algebra is just a Fréché space, meaning it's some locally convex vector space with the topology defined by countably many C my norms, and that is complete. And so if you remember how we defined the topology on there, we just took the topology of local uniform convergence on the, of, on the space of holomorphic functions, and that is, in, that is indeed induced by countably many C my norms, and indeed, that space is complete. So we really have a Fréché space. And now Fréché algebra just means that this product is continuous with respect to the topology that we just defined. Okay, and here are just two further properties. So first of all, if we take any polynomials, then we really get the, um, the correct limit that I wanted to have in the beginning. So if we just look at the product of two polynomials, take the limit h bar tending to zero. Then we just get a regular product. And if you look at the commutator, we get i times the Poisson bracket. And furthermore, if we want to study the dependence of this product on h bar, then it turns out that that is very nice because it's going to be holomorphic. OK. So far, so good. I mentioned that essentially the very same thing works for co-joint orbits. So let me just state the theorem here, which is essentially exactly the same as this theorem, except for that we need to allow for a countable set of poles accumulating only at zero, and then everything works for H bar, not in the set of poles. And uh, I did Philip, try. Yes. Uh, it's a five minute warning. Yes, sure. And uh, what was I about to say? That this algebra of analytic functions on the cogent orbit can be essentially defined exactly the same way as before for CPN, where the idea is that this CPN hat, so this extended CPN is just a complexification of this orbit, and then everything goes through just as before. Okay, and here's basically a summary of what I just did. So, so the idea is of, of this whole construction is really work with the complexifications or really work with these extended phase spaces instead of the usual CPN or the usual cogent orbit. Because then, well, there is a construction of Alexiev and Lachowska of such a star product on the holomorphic functions. That will be the input to all what I said. And then we can basically run this procedure that I outlined here by just restricting everything to sorry, restricting everything to polynomials or holomorphic polynomials on this extension, then doing the completion for which, it, for which it, it is actually important that we work with holomorphic functions because we need a lot of tools from complex analysis and then restrict ourselves to, to the real forms in the very end. And there's one, there's one direct consequence of the, the, that approach, namely if we now take two different real orbits which have the same complexification because we, re because we really just quantize the complexifications and then restrict to the orbit. And then the restriction in the end is actually an isomorphism on this algebra of analytic functions. 
we get isomorphic Fréchet algebras if we start with real orbits that have the same complexification. But there is one thing, these, the, if we also consider star involutions on these algebras, then this isomorphism will not be con compatible with the star involutions. I should just point that out. Okay, and finally, to round this off, let me just tell you why you might want to care about these Fréchet algebras. And the idea there is that essentially the construction that I presented to you um, did not consider the poles, but there is something that you can do at the poles. And if you do that, essentially, the, or said differently, if you describe the star product by explicit formulas, then you will notice that these formulas stay well defined at the poles, or these values one over n, but only on polynomials up to a certain degree. So only on polynomials up to a certain degree n. And if you know a bit about geometric quantization or Bernstein triplets quantization, then you actually get exactly some finite dimensional algebras at these discrete values of h bar that are approximate for you the smooth functions on on CPN. And well, in this approach, these algebras coincide exactly with the Bernstein quantization. So in a sense, what this result tells us is that the Fréchet algebras that I just described, they somehow smoothly interpolate between these finite dimensional algebras that you obtain with Bernstein quantization. And well, that could be very interesting to study. Or said differently, if you view it rep representation theoretic, then you somehow get some infinite dimensional representations or something that's smoothly interpolate between the finite dimensional representations that are relevant for defining this Bernstein quantization. And well, with that, I would like to thank you for your attention and say that in my second part of the talk, I will essentially try to go through these steps again and just tell you in more detail what co-joint orbits are, what, what complexifications of co-joint orbits are, how the star product is constructed, and so on and so forth. Thanks. Thank you very much, Philip. Thank you for a one really wonderful talk. Uh, oh, I, I love, I really love Leonid's uh, clapping emoji. It's, it's like the next level of clapping emojis. Really, really chic. Oh. <laughs> wow. I don't. I'm, I'm jealous now. I want the same. <laughs> okay. So uh, very good. So now um, uh, we are starting the uh, parallel session. Uh, Part of our uh, of our conference, um, so there's four rooms, uh, one for each one for each speaker. Um, so uh, all of this information is in the conference package. But uh, just to just to be kind of completely clear, so Leonid uh, goes into room one, uh, Joel goes into room two, Jan goes into room three, and uh, Philip goes into room four. Um, so these rooms, uh, so rooms, uh, Nasty, have you opened? Um, yes, yes, first two yeah. rooms are open. Okay, and the, and rooms three and four are open. So um, you you should take, uh, you know, maybe a few minutes break. Um, Stretch a little bit. Yeah, especially the I speakers. Definitely need. Yeah, um, and then um, uh, and then just join uh, join the um, the parallel session rooms. Okay. So, uh, so let's take a break, uh, and uh, we'll see each other in in this in the in the parallel session rooms. And this room will be still open, right? And this, we yes, will, this we will room, keep it hosted. This this room so will if, remain open. If if you get lost, if you feel that something is going wrong, you can always enter the main conference room and find Nikita here. Right. Or use Slack. Hi.